Okay, folks, thank you very much for uh, coming to the SDN controller panel. This is going to be a very interesting discussion because the first 30 minute segment, we're going to talk about Cisco strategy, SDN strategy, as well as products in SDN. The second 30 minutes, we're going to do a deep dive into SDN, and in both cases, we'll be taking questions from the audience. So, one thing I want to encourage audience participation is ask a question, get a scarf. That's a pretty cool thing. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to introduce each of the executives who are here with us. And just please raise your hand so people know who you are. And then they will do a one slide presentation on their product. It will be about three to five minutes. When that's done, I ask you to hold your questions until everyone has done their presentation. And then we will take those questions. So the first person I'd like to introduce is Christine Bakken. She's the Senior Director of Software Defined Networking and open standards product management in the enterprise networking segment at Cisco. She also for, holds uh, four patents in Cisco and Oracle applications and database technologies. Phil Cassini. Phil's currently the product management director for Cisco's LAN WAN SGN controller named APIC EM. Previously, he was a product management lead for Cisco's XNC data center focused SDN controller, which became part of Cisco's initial contribution to the Open Daylight project. Phil's also a member of the cross-functional team that set the initial SDN strategy for Cisco. Ranga Rial is the Director of Technical Marketing with Cisco, focused on Nexus and ACR architectures. He spent the last three years working on SDN technologies, including leading project management for open flow based technologies at Big Switch Networks. And Stefan Vallon, he's a product manager for Network Services Orchestrator Platform, also known as NCS. He has a PhD in network management and has been, been a consultant for 20 years. So, folks, just to um, re speak about our agenda here. So, this is the order of the presentations. And again, when we're done with the presentations, and those will take about three to five minutes apiece, then we'll take your questions. Uh, and then at the bottom of the hour, or I should say the top of the hour, then we will have the technologists come over to take even the um, deeper level questions as well. So Christine, would you start with your uh, presentation? I'll go ahead and just queue up your slide here. OK. Why don't I uh, maybe get out of the way so you guys can see the screen? Okay, so let, why, don't, why don't I start with our open daylight based controller solution. It's again, as the name suggests, it's really a commercial distribution of the open daylight software. Um, there are key focus areas that we're targeting our open daylight based solution on. First and foremost, it's really an app development platform, meaning that it really provides a lot of rich abstraction information about the network that can be developed on top of, you know, to build services, to build applications, et cetera. So it's really a flexible, rich platform that we're working heavily to make sure that our partners and our customers are able to develop uh, effectively on through DevNet support, et cetera. Uh, the second piece to take away is that it's really a SP WAN and multi-layer management SDN platform. So our Cisco, SP WAN solution, such as our uh, WAN automation engine, for example, is built directly on top of the open SDN controller platform. The third piece is that really it's also a uh, open flow, a very rich open flow platform. We actually have a demo at one of our booths that show you how you can manage the open flow network. And in the US public sector and in the higher education uh, sector, this is something that is being heavily used uh, as a way to manage their, their uh, high traffic flow-based networks. So that's the third area of focus for our open SDN controller. Currently, we're in uh, early beta trials with our customers. And our target timeline to make it generally available is April of this year. So it's only about three months away. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, Phil Cassini is next. He's going to talk about APIC EM. Great. By just show of hands real quick, how many people have heard of APIC EM? Okay, about half of you. Great. So uh, 
really what this controller is, is breaking new ground for the application of SDN in the enterprise. Most of the controllers that have been built, have been built that are data centric, data centric centric, are really about flow traffic and engineering and flow management. But if you think about a LAN or a WAN network, it really cares about user policies. You want to make sure that two hosts can connect, whether I'm trying to connect to a video server or some training or to a database or even to an application. So the idea behind an enterprise controller is that it really does user policy. So what we're doing is abstracting a lot of the uh, management of uh, quality of service, applications access, and configuration management uh, out of the need to do that uh, on a box-by-box -box basis and centralizing that into a controller that says, now when Phil starts his day at home, in a, or come in my car or I'm in my office, I have different application access needs and I have different policy needs, uh, particularly when it uh, comes to video or voice bandwidth, they can be adjusted uh, quite quickly. So the idea behind APIC EM is that it's a user policy based controller mechanism and the application of SDN allows us to create applications on top and port a lot of the assets that Cisco has in the enterprise today around collaboration, around security, uh, around uh, orchestration and around a uh, very popular topic today, uh, WAN provisioning. So for example, if you go to the show floor in World of Solutions, you'll see call manager doing dynamic QoS using the APIC EM to guarantee connectivity of two endpoints and the quality of service. You'll see uh, full remediation of security, uh, including threat detection from a number of different sources but also the threat remediation in real time at the edge using APKM because it has a lot of that information. So think about user policies and the application of that and whole solutions. Um, and that's what we're moving to is sort of a solutions concept for enterprises in these categories that are based on SDN, but really the applications drive a lot of that value. And hopefully the net result of that will be you being able to take technologies that we have and ingest them faster and cheaper than you ever have before. Uh, Rango will be next. Rango, Thank I'll go you. ahead and queue this up for you. Thank you. I represent uh, the Cisco's data center technologies uh, from a SDN perspective. Data centers have different characteristics and basically very unique requirements. Uh, if you look at a typical data center, it's very, very intense from a tra intensive from a bandwidth and traffic perspective. We are seeing customers use some of our products and putting uh, about five terabits of switching capacity into every rack. You know, so if you look at the aggregate switching capacity within a data center, it essentially turns out to be quite a bit of bandwidth within the data center. So what we have realized working with customers is that a flow-based management solution within the data center is not something that really scales. So as Cisco, we have uh, looked at what kind of technologies customers would want from an SDN perspective within the data center and built a policy-based management infrastructure. And the product that I work on is uh, broadly called as ACI or application-centric infrastructure. And I'll share why in a moment. Um, and the controller in this particular environment is APIC or the application policy infrastructure controller. So as I said, we do not focus on flow-based management. We f focus on application policies like the policy that's shown over here, where you can describe the needs of your application in a very abstract language. We have come up with a very abstract representation of the network connectivity and characteristics that applications need within a data center. You could say for a three-tier application, I have these kind of requirements. And uh, the, the three tiers and the requirements of connectivity and security between the different tiers and provide that to the controller. And the controller essentially pushes this information down to the switches and provides them with the policies. So it sort of downloads the policies. From then on, the switches have the capability to enforce policies and essentially um, make sure that the right kind of connectivity and security characteristics are delivered for the applications. This is very, very different from a flow-based management solution that uh, a lot of the uh, industry conversations have been centered around. And we think this model where the policy enforcement happens in the switches in the data path and not really in a software controller is more scalable, more reliable. And this is a technology that we have been shipping since August of last year. 
and we have well over 200 customers who have essentially adopted this technology. And we are seeing a significant momentum uh, of, uh, towards adoption of this technology within data centers of various different classes of customers, right from the small customers who are essentially trying to build their next generation network to the largest service provider customers who are trying to build multi-tenant cloud-based infrastructures for uh, their customers. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Stephen Vallon will be next. I'll key you up, Stephen. Yeah. So I'm the black sheep. We're not the controller. Very important. We're an orchestrator. Uh, so we come from TLF, and the product was known as NCS. Yeah, six months ago, we joined Cisco to be the network services orchestrator. So now when you hear NSO from Cisco, that's, that's TLF when you open the box. What we do north of the controllers, that's very important. We, we look at the network, and there's a desire from the north, from the typical OSS system, from self-service portals or, or anything, to provision a service in the network. What we do is we transform that request into whatever is needed to be provisioned in the network. And, and south of us can be different things. The various controllers typically live south of us, but the, the controller covers a piece of the network. There is a very fundamental part of the network that are traditional physical devices for any operator today. So we orchestrate also to the physical and, of course, to, to the virtual. So the, the role of this engine to be the orchestrator on top, to take whatever customer request comes in, transform to whatever reconfigs are needed, and map that to the existing management interfaces on the existing network. So it acts upon the available management interfaces, so the northbound of ODL, the northbound of the, of the APIX, et cetera. That, that's where we work. And I would say one of the most important features why customers like AT&T and Deutsche Telekom, et cetera, picked us. We've been shipping since four years, this product, in operation. The, the traditional, I would say, the, the dominant use case is still layer two, layer three VPNs, still an unsolved problem on the market. We, we can look at fancy new things, but VPNs are still not solved, so that, that's one of the core things we do. The main characteristics of the platform itself is, first of all, brownfield, dirty. You never, you never do a greenfield network. You have physical things, you have open flow things, you have virtual, you have existing stuff in the network. So I would say the brownfield capabilities the other thing is the flexibility of the platform to be able to describe with external Yang data models how the network service should be provisioned rather than having hard-coded or extensive programming. It's driven by external declarative data models to quickly adopt the changes in the service portfolio. Thank you. So everyone, when we put our chairs back together, what we'll do at this point is take questions from the audience and again, we're talking about strategy, we're talking about controllers, uh, orchestrators, and just as a back, you know, just to remind you, so we're basically talking about three controllers. We looked at APIC EM, we looked at ACI, we also looked at OpenSDN controller, and then an orchestrator, which is our uh, network controller service. And remember, ask a question, get a scarf. So is there any questions that we could, uh, that we'd like to start with? Anyone uh, have any questions regarding strategy, regarding controllers or the orchestrator? Yes. I think she'll be giving you a mic. Or I'll give you the mic. She's got the mic. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> Hi. It's about strategy. Uh, it's clear that Cisco is uh, pushing toward declarative and data model SDN, declarative and data model SDN. But I heard they are, you are deprecating 1PK. Can you confirm it? And if, it's, uh, if you are deprecating 1PK, why is it still supporting OpenFlow, for example? So, uh, so in terms of 1PK, you know, it's one of those things where we definitely, you know, are not moving away from device programmability as our strategy. We're looking to continue to enforce the device programmability paradigms. We're looking at really, you know, what are the things that will help us achieve, you know, more wider adoption of some of our device programmability interfaces, for example. 
Um, to be honest, to be very candid, I mean, 1PK is our device programmability interface, hasn't necessarily been the most widely adopted mechanism for programming to our devices. So from a company strategy perspective, we're definitely looking at that and saying, is there something that we need to do to update our strategy? So that's definitely something that we're doing now, is saying, look, we need to make sure that if we're providing device programmability, that it's easy to use, that it's something that's going to become standards-based, and also something that we feel that we're very comfortable, that can be very comprehensive in terms of functionality across our platforms. And those are things that we're not necessarily confident that 1PK is doing, that, doing for us today. So we're certainly looking to make sure that our strategy is keeping up with the goals that we have for device programmability. So uh, in terms of OpenFlow, uh, 1PK does provide OpenFlow interfaces to the device. Uh, we're also realizing, look, 1PK is one mechanism for providing OpenFlow interfaces. There are controller interfaces available now with Open Daylight Based Solution, which I just mentioned a little bit earlier. And then also, in terms of device APIs, from the devices itself, we're looking at, is there a, you know, is there a more performant way? Some of our devices during our internal lab tests, we haven't found that uh, our interfaces through 1PK scale as well as we would like it to. So we're looking at looking we're looking at essentially improving our device inter, uh, device programmability interface strategy, not necessarily moving to deprecate it. I mean, of course, Cisco is big, so any statements are are sort of geared, of course. But uh, from from a standards point of view, one movement that is very strong and that Cisco is pushing is the IETF standard for device programmability, which is NetConf and Yang. So go, like XR is just released with a proper NetConf and Yang. It's not the, there has been some, some not proper NetConf interfaces within Cisco. Now there's a proper one. So XR is already out with, with proper NetConf and Yang. That's going to evolve. Uh, we're historically at tail left. We worked hard in, in ITF along NetConf and Yang. And that, that's increasing uh, within Cisco now as the programmable config interface. There, there are stats, there are open flow. Those are other things, but when it comes to Config. I'm pretty sure NetConf and Yang will make a brand new future there. Yeah, let me let me reinforce that. So I would definitely say that our direction is to provide consistent interfaces through the NetConf interface, for example. That is definitely the direction that we're heading in, and also being model driven. So Yang model definitions is an example of what we're seeing standardized in the industry. So again, we want to move towards standardization based device programmability. Period um, from Cisco. So you know, we're not building something that isn't necessarily becoming a standard in the industry. Does, does that help answer your question? So let me just uh, ask a question that some folks have brought when I've been uh, at the pod demoing SDN. So Cisco has, as you guys know from uh, just earlier, three different controllers and an orchestrator. So the question is, is why does Cisco believe that we need three different uh, controllers and an orchestrator? at this time for SDN? Yeah, I, I could answer that as well, unless somebody else wants to take a shot. OK, so, so what we're seeing really is that network administration isn't necessarily done you know, consistently across the different parts of the network. So the data center, you know, the, 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 the drivers for the data center network management and network control are different than what we're seeing, for example, on the campus branch side of the network and absolutely different than what we're seeing on the service provider type of networks. So because of these asymmetric business drivers, we're saying, look, we want to optimize our use cases and our SDN functionality by domain. So Cisco is taking a much more comprehensive approach versus saying, here's one SDN solution that will do it all for you. I would say that it would be very challenging for our vendor competitors to actually deliver a comprehensive solution with a single SDN strategy. So the way that we are looking at it is, look, we understand the network the best. We understand the fact that we have different business drivers by domain. So people who are managing the SP type of networks versus, again, campus branch type of networks, very different type of drivers and different types of needs. So we're, op we're, in fact, optimizing and we're enriching our SDN strategy so that we provide a more comprehensive and more targeted solution by, by domain. So, yeah. 
Let me just add to that that um, if you think about if you you've seen any of the uh, uh, pub publicity we have around the application-centric infrastructure, it really is about an abstracted policy uh, and allowing you to have business intent personalization of your network without having to worry about specific domains. So today you separate the, or today you have combined what and when. When you want to put a security policy across your network, you have to think about the security policy and you have to think about all of the ACLs or all the configuration changes that you need to, to do and then you need to go into the different domains and the different boxes to program that. So one of the things we've done to sort of make it sure, make sure that while we have several controllers in the system or in the networks, it still looks like one policy is the extension of that ACI construct that was built for the data center into the, uh, into the campus and LAN and, and even through into the WAN now. And so what that really means is, for example, if I want to do a, 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 an IP video or a voice session, uh, if I'm a user policy centric controller, I worry about whether the path can actually connect, allow us to connect and allow us to get a quality of service. But if I'm in the data center, I worry a lot about things like jitter. I think worry about paths that aren't optimized. And so one policy, one in 10 policy, can be cross the, the, the domains into the different controllers, and it's up to the controllers underneath the hood to take care of the differences. And so you see from Ranga, for, for example, worrying about the fabric impact of something like that, and me worrying about, uh, and the APIC EM, worrying about you know, the user path. But that's all abstracted and hidden. And so while we do have multiple controllers, we have one single policy that is cross-domain, and that's really important because when you begin to use these, you don't have to worry about the cross-domain differences. So we have about uh, five more minutes before we uh, bring up our technologists. Are there any other questions from the audience regarding strategy, direction, for Cisco regarding uh, the controllers as well as the orchestrator? So let me go ahead and ask another question that I had been asked. We, we've talked a little bit about API strategy. We know there was a question about 1PK, but regarding the new APIs that we're releasing, what are the strategies for our APIs? Where are we headed with those APIs? I can hand it to him. Yeah. So, um, I mean, API is something that vendors have been provide, trying to incorporate into their offerings. And today, open APIs, I would say, is pretty much an open uh, a table stake uh, in all our platforms. So if you look at some of the things that we are trying to do, as Christine said, we are trying to back every, uh, uh, every offering that we have with a model behind it. So for example, in the APIC case or the ACI data center infrastructure case, each of our switches, the operating system, the information that it holds, it holds it in a database. And that database is completely accessible through RESTful interface. So you imagine a developer being able to access every piece of information that the software knows, both the configuration state and the operation state across the entire infrastructure. It really, really opens up uh, a lot of program possibilities from a programmability perspective. So we are working towards embedding more model-based uh, ob object-oriented object infrastructures into all our offerings. We already have this from a data per center perspective on some of our products, particularly around ACI, and we are bringing the same technologies into some of our Nexus OS and uh, uh, Nexus OS offerings in uh, the data center. So that's uh, APIs from a data center perspective where you can access every piece of information that's possible and wrap it around with uh, logic to expose capabilities that we haven't been able to expose before. I, I think in general, that's across the controllers. That's the general philosophy, right? You access kinds of different information for different applications or different use cases. But again, in the campus controller that we're building, it's the same thing. We have the configuration information. Uh, for each of the, uh, the boxes that you can look at, including the configurations, the IDs, how they're programmed, and, and so on and so forth. But in, in particular, in the, uh, in the campus controller, you also have uh, cached user access. So we go out through a Radius server or through Active Directory and actually cache a lot of the user information. Why? Because in a user policy, you want to figure out where the, the user is, and then you want to tune the kind of policies uh, that, are in, that are enforced when he logs onto the network from where he is. So the mobility is an important part. But in general, the RESTful API constructs are becoming the standard mechanism by which we, we, uh, we communicate those to the applications. 
And REST is not a programming language, right? It's a, it's a uniform API set. It's been used in the enterprise software world for 15 years. Um, and the biggest benefit of using REST is the idea that you don't have to do major surgery on either the, any of the components. Even if they, don't, they function differently, you can just describe, going back to what I said earlier, the what. If I can just say, hey, this is what I need you to do. I don't tell you how to do it. I can put disparate pieces of the network together very quickly. And then it doesn't matter whether it's an open source controller, it's something that Ranga is building for the data center or for what I have. So REST API is going to be a, a term that you're going to hear. And it's not just Cisco pervasive, I believe it's also industry pervasive. And then what's underneath the hood, the services and so on and so forth, are some of the constructs and the calls that you make uh, through the REST API. So the benefit if you're an applications developer is you have uniformity on how you uh, structurally connect to these controllers. The calls may be different for different reasons, but the, you have uniformity around the, the application's development. And that allows you to be able to have massive portability and cross-domain uh, cross uh, visibility. A few comments on that. There are a couple of things to, to think about when you talk about APIs. Uh, I think the first thing is that it needs to be standardized and it needs to be interoperable. So. Of course, we have REST APIs, we have that as well, but I just want to raise a bit of warning flags. As with all technologies, you, you can, it can be good, it can be bad. Remember that REST is, is not standard. It's not, it's not something that you can interoperable test. It's a design pattern, a very elegant design pattern, very easy to use. So of course, you should have REST APIs, but I've, I've seen many mistakes, people jumping. Well, we've seen the, the sort of people moving from SOAP Nowadays, REST. So REST is a loosely defined API concept, which is easy to use. Of course, you should have it. But remember, there is no, da there is no data model in REST. So there's a risk. You get a payload, which might be whatever. So we need to have some kind of modeling language along with the REST API. Another thing, we need to have a bit of uh, design patterns on top of REST. I've, I've touched many devices lately that are very proudly present REST APIs, and they don't even have the most important config operation number one, give me the config. Any CLI engineer knows that I can't do network management if I can't do show run and config. Nine out of 10 REST APIs that pop out don't do that. So we, we tend to forget very important design principles when we jump into a new RPC mechanism. So REST is good, it's easy to use, Remember, you need a data model, you need transactionality, you need that on top of REST. So maybe RESTConf, at least RESTConf tells you more than REST in general. So it was a bit of warning flag around the very good thing. So I, I assume most people, since this is the DevNode zone, are interested in API. So I mean, it's a good topic to talk about. I would say really, I mean, again, not all APIs need to be, you know, need to be doing everything. On the S, on the SP side of the house, it's a lot about it. Is a lot, lot of the API needs are about provisioning and configuration, heavily so, right? Because you want to be able to go out and turn up services, be able to provision services quickly, et cetera. So really, the APIs that we're building with our SP solutions are optimized to be able to do that. So that you could go ahead and get the config information, be able to go ahead and quickly put provision things, provide transactionality, et cetera. And really, you know, what we're seeing in terms of NetConf interfaces, RESTConf interfaces are appropriate for that. On the data center side or even on the campus branch side, you know, the APIs that are being built for that, uh, you know, for those kind of business drivers in these spaces aren't necessarily the same as what we need on the, you know, on the core service provider uh, service activation type of use cases. So what we see in the data center, uh, the core data center, for example, is, look, I want to go ahead and automate my end-to-end -end, you know, tool chain-based IT automation. So I want to be able to use my uh, you know, like config tool chains from my server automation. So for example, Puppet Chef type of tool chains and be able to go ahead and you know, automate down to my network uh, management side of the house. So those APIs that we would provide 
for those kind of end-to-end -to -end tool chain automation are not necessarily you know, going to need to have the same kind of characteristics as the APIs that our service provider customers are using. So again, you know, we're looking at it in terms of what are the core drivers and what are the needs of the developers by the type of applications and the type of development they need to do and not, you know, not try to glaze over it and say, we have you know, common APIs necessarily that we'll go ahead and do everything for you because REST doesn't go ahead and do everything that you need from, you know, for example, customers that might be looking to do like net comp interfaces. So we're providing different options for customers. Thank you. I want to invite our technologists to come up and I want to ask our, our uh, directors to have a seat in the audience. And I'll go ahead and introduce our technologists. Stefan gets to do double duty. Lucky guy. And as I introduce you, please uh, raise your hand so people know who you are. Blue Lang. Blue's the chief architect of APIC EM. Longtime Unix sysadmin, pause, and cloud services architect. He's a current over owner of the overall APIC EM architecture. Most importantly, he's the former best beard in Cisco, but he was forced to shave it because he had a date that he had to go on, unfortunately. Giles Heron. Is it Giles or Giles? I'm sorry. Giles? G. Has spent the last 25 years writing networking software and building and operating large scale service provider IP MPLS networks. Now focuses on creating service provider SDN applications and supporting the open SDN controller. Jason Pfeiffer is a Cisco technical solutions architect focusing on programmability and automation of Cisco network devices. He's currently supporting, discussing, and evangelizing Cisco's Nexus 9000 platform. This is the fo these are the folks that you can now ask your technical questions to regarding SDN, functionality, APIs, and such. And I encourage the audience to get as many scarves as you can and begin asking technical questions that these folks can answer regarding their controllers, SDN, and so forth. Any questions? Yes. What is the Cisco view regarding the east-west interactions with other SDN controllers? So do you have a view on this for integrating different domains, for instance? I guess uh, to some level there, you're starting to talk almost about hierarchies of controllers. You know, if you're, if you're trying to orchestrate multiple controllers. So, you know, I guess in many ways, that's what, what we've already covered in terms of NCS and that it can have other, other controllers sitting beneath it. And it, it really, it's, a, it's then a question of what's your, you know, what is it you're trying to achieve with that orchestration? You know, if it's configuration, then, you know, clearly NSO is a tool. But then, you know, w what is it you want to do across domains? And perhaps the solution is going to be different depending on what it is. It, it could uh, depend fr from the fact that you have a different domain, so maybe you don't need a single controller. So I see that your solution is quite open. So I'm really wondering about integrating different domains uh, via different SDN controllers. So I expect also in, in this direction, your solution should be quite open. Yeah, we've already done quite a lot of work on integration. So particularly with, with the TLF stuff and with the Open SDN controller, so each of them can control the other one, that sort of thing. So we've we've done the work to make sure that works. And we also want to unify the top level data models for the common components. So there is a topology model that all of the controllers must expose, and then based on that, the applications above it can aggregate that information. So we won't necessarily attempt to aggregate and deduplicate information at the controller by controller level. We'll provide you a standardized format for the information, and the apps can deduplicate it. Does that make sense? Looking at it from the orchestrator point of view, to comment on that, that's very much true. When it comes to the configuration data and decomposing a service request into different controllers, that's typically decomposed in the orchestrator, but that's for the, for the config data. And uh, since, since the orchestrator is not an SDN controller, what is not synchronized in the orchestrator in the TLFSS is when it comes to the sort of running flows, the statistics, and that kind, if you go into that kind of, of east to west integration, that is nothing, something that needs to be shared in real time between the SDN controllers. That cannot pass up to the orchestrator. So you need to separate sort of, are we talking about flows, stats, or are we talking about, about the config things? 
So remember, the questions that you ask don't necessarily have to be a deep dive into SDN. If you're just getting started with SDN, maybe you have a question I'd like to pose to the panel. What does decoupling hardware in SDN really mean between the, the when we're talking about the two different planes, the controller plane and the data plane? What does that really mean? And I think that'll give folks an idea of what SDN really is. So would someone take that question? In APIC EM, it means externalizing the, the policy, the intent, away from the hardware itself and treating your network as a network. Uh, in the enterprise module, we do very, very little. We expose very little at the device level. What you're mainly trying to do is tell the entire network or a segment of network or a group of devices how you would like them to operate, how you would like them to approach users, and how you would like them to approach applications. Uh, the control plane, data plane, you know, for the majority uh, are still stuck in the devices themselves. What we're doing is influencing their behavior uh, based on policy. Yeah, I think that to some extent that whole um, thing about decoupling the control plane from data plane came very much from the open flow approach. And as I guess we've already said, that, that doesn't necessarily scale that well. And so I think we seeing more likely where people use open flow, they're using it in a hybrid mode where they still run OSPF or ISS or whatever in the network. And they use open flow to kind of override the normal path. So I, I think, to some extent, I'm not, I'm not convinced that really what you're trying to do is separate your control plane from your forwarding plane to that, in that sort of religious manner. I think the key thing, I mean, yeah, the thing I, the thing I always come up to in the end is that, you know, Reese has been, sorry, routers, I'm an international audience, we've been, you know, we've been making them for years and years, and they are just computers that have an interface which was actually designed for a human to drive them, because we put a CLI on it, so that an engineer could sit at the CLI. And then having come myself from an SP background, what did we do? We wanted to automate provisioning. So what did we do? We wrote a system that pretended to be a human talking to a router that was pretending to be a human. I mean, that's, that, that's not, it can't be the right way to do it. So to me, SDN is about APIs fundamentally. And it's about, so I was saying to a customer today, you know, taking NCS as an example, you know, you, you typically find again when you're coding that, you know, 10% of your effort is doing what you want to do. And, 90% is handling error conditions. The moment you have something that wraps everything up into a transaction, you don't have to worry as the person writing the app about how do I deal with, you know, I can figure router A okay, but I don't router B, what do I do? We abstract that away for you. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, in the APIC data center space, we work on this model of promise theory, basically saying, you know, what is the intent? What do I want to do? And Worrying about how it gets done is pushed down from the, the southbound protocol. So you don't have to worry about specifically how do I configure each individual device, but let's look at the system as a whole, say what I want done, and let that get done by the pro underlying protocols. So, you know, contrasting that with something like OpenFlow, where, you're, where you have a, a system where you have to look at every single flow that's going through a device and deciding what to do with that flow, it's a, you know, it's a little different model there. A little different way to, to think about SDN. Just a final comment there. Uh, today, when you talk about SDN, it's, it's very much this centralized control plane thinking. Uh, a couple of years ago, before that happened, SDN was a more general concept, talking about abstractions and APIs. So back in those days, seems like 10 years ago, we talked about our software as a SDN thing because what it does is it provides an API towards the services in the network. It would be a disaster for us today to talk about, about us as a SDN because we're, we're not a controller. But if you step back a little bit, it's abstractions and it's APIs and abstractions live at different layers. Uh, I, I hear a very interesting talk from an OSS manager from a large service provider and I, I, I really couldn't understand what he said. He said, Wow, it's great now with SDN because my OSS system can talk open flow to the switches in the network. So good luck building that kind of OSS. Yeah, the one I was I always think about having having been previously at service providers, and I, you know, I saw our capex budgets, and most of the money was not spent on the network elements. It was spent on the OSS. So the thing we should be trying to optimize is how do we make it easier to do the OSS? And back to this, you know, this exact point that if you can express your intent then writing your OSS has got to be easier. And if you can do it with a clean API and something that's transactional, then again, writing that's got to be easier. 
and, and the only plane that's actually in a networking device is the ground plane. I mean, these are all sort of academic, you know, arguments, philosophical arguments, and I, I guess we sort of a universal agreement here that we're just not that into it. There's a better way to do it, we think, and policy and, and ACI are it. So which uh, SDN questions does the audience have? Anything regarding how it would be applied, what it's about, or maybe deeper questions? Give us something tough. Hi. If I'm a developer and, and, and I'm trying to get in, into using APIs and working with SDN more, what do you think the first use case is that I should go after? Like, what's a good use case to tackle as your first foray into working with APIs and controllers? Automate anything. Uh, I mean, that's, you know, for all of us, I think it's all about automation, and that's, that's the promise and the delivery of, of the controllers that we've all built and worked on. Uh, whatever task your, your uh, network manager goes through every day, whatever support calls you're getting all the time, figure out a way to use a controller to automate that task out of your life. Yeah, it couldn't, couldn't agree more. And just find something that you want to automate and automate it. And, uh, and initially, maybe do something that's kind of just for fun. Um, but yeah, certainly once you're in an operation environment, it's the, I guess it's that DevOps model of, you know, your, your role should be, every, the, the first time you find a problem, you fix it manually. The second time and then on, you should fix it in an automated way. So you don't spend your life doing boring stuff because, you know, who wants to do that? Yeah, that's right. It, uh, automation is, is key in all of this. Um, learn the, the API, the northbound API is, you know, that's what you're going to be interacting with. Mostly a, a REST-based API, so you know, understand the concepts of REST. Understand, uh, you know, it's very easy to, to call a REST call in a Python script or uh, you know, using a scripting language. So you know, pick that up and uh, run with that. That'd be the you know, just good starting point. Yeah, actually, on, try, on REST API, so the first thing is just literally fire one up in a browser, so you can just do a guess operation. Then get something like Postman running in Chrome, so you can start to put data into the API as well. And then, yeah, do Python, but um, just steal somebody else's script. Don't write it from scratch. And, and we can provide them if you want. One thing I'd like to let everyone know when we're talking about getting started, one, one second, sir, is that we have learning labs on the end or end of this building. And back there, you can do all this hands-on. There's scripts, there's information, there's all these different products that we support, APIC EM, uh, ACI, as well as OpenSD controller for you to use, so you can get hands on with that. You had a question? All of the controllers we're talking about have REST APIs, which are clearly functional, but after you've used one for a few times and tried to decode HTTP, you're pretty soon going to wrap that into some kind of API to make it easier to use. That is naturally going to be a growth of a lot of Python or Java code, perhaps, that are wrapping these HTTP interactions, and then you start to build up a library of utilities around that, and that's what you typically start to work with long term. Because we've got different controller and orchestrator platforms here, it seems to me there's an opportunity to use those utilities to create some kind of normalization across the different domains. What are your thoughts about that? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely, uh, and hopefully uh, that's a place where the open source community can help us out. Uh, get on GitHub and build up a nice SDK. Uh, internally, of course, we have Java tools and JavaScript tools that do all of that, um, or Python and JavaScript for APIC EM anyway, but that seems like a fantastic project for somebody to get running and, and uh, help us out with. How we tackle that is to, to the, the, the data models we, we have in the orchestrator provides two layers. So the bottom layer are the Yang da device data models. Doesn't matter if it's NetConf southbound, but what the, the various APIs, the, the various sort of data models you have south, south we unify in one layer. Then the most important layer is the next layer above where, where you abstract the services again in Yang data model. And okay, so do we have a huge mapping problem? You, you could easily escape now into two million lines of Python again. So what we have we gained? So what we've tried to, to simplify this unification process, not escape to brute force programming. So we have a de declarative mapping layer there. This is the service model. These are the various distinct domain specific models and there's a declarative data model mapping layer in between to make it quick to do this translation from a normalized model into the specific models 
because it can easily explode in millions of lines of Java and Python if you don't take care of that layer. So that's what we focused on in the orchestrator to do that declarative mapping. Yeah, you, I actually pushed them out to YouTube, so I have two hours tutor technical tutorial on, on Yang and Netconf. You just Google uh, Yang tutorial, Stefan Molino something on YouTube, there's a tutorial there. Also, if any of you are working with the Nexus 9000 platform, you can actually turn on a, a feature in XAPI, point your web browser directly to the device itself, and it gives you a sandbox where you can hit a Python button, and it'll show you how to interact th with the device through a Python script. You can copy that script off, run it uh, manually, and then you, you know, it gets you started on your way to learning Python, how to make calls into the, dev the device through that NX API as well. So how would they access that, Jason? Do they need to have that device, or is there another way of getting access to those APIs you just talked about? In, in that case, it, you do have to have access to the device directly. Yeah, okay. So that's a direct device program building. Okay. There's been, there's been discussion here about north and south bound APIs. I've heard those words mentioned. Can you guys tell us what the difference is between north and south bound APIs uh, regarding controllers and such? Or is there not yeah, a difference? So a northbound API is, is usually what a person would write to. That's the, the API above the controller. That's usually a, a REST based API or JSON based API or Java based API. Southbound API is the controller talking to the devices that it's uh, orchestrating or managing. Uh, in the case of ACI, the OpFlex protocol is the southbound API, which is an open protocol. But that's where you convert from the promise theory of what you want, the intent of what you want to do down to what gets done on the device, the configuration on the device. That's something the user doesn't have to worry about. They just interact with the northbound API through the rest base interface. Yeah, one thing I was going to say, a slight word of caution, of course, is that um, you know, north and south is always relative to where you're standing. So, I mean, generally, we're talking about it from a controller perspective. Yes, yeah, northbound typically is, is the REST API, southbound are the different device APIs. But equally, sometimes watch out for the fact you might be coming from somewhere else. So from, you know, if, you're, if um, NCS is orchestrating the Cisco OpenSDN controller, well, he'll think of it as a southbound. We'll think of it as a northbound. And if we do it the other way, the reverse is true. So, yeah, watch out for that one. So it can be turned on its head is what you're saying? Yeah, pretty yeah. much. OK. I mean, it's always. Everything else depends on where you're coming from. So let me introduce a new term, NFV, Network Function Virtualization. Some of you may have heard of that. How is that different than SDN? How is SDN and NFV different? Are they the same? <laughs> so, what's that? <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, so NFV um, is basically abstracting out the, the layer four through seven services. Um, network function virtualization, being able to have virtual, uh, separating hardware and software from each other uh, for things like a, a firewall, load balancer, uh, intrusion detection system, all of that, uh, being able to abstract that out and turn that into software, interact with that through a software-based uh, uh, mechanism or, or API. So, you know, interacting with, it, it, it works in conjunction with SDN, it's, you know, a, a I don't know if you call it a piece of SDN, but um, you know, SDN is usually working at the lower layers, where NFV is working at the layer four through seven type services. Yeah, I think one other thing to say of, of why they perhaps fit together is that um, you know, typically, historically, you've had you know, routers or switches in your network, you know, limited in number. Now with NFV, you can be spinning things up on demand. So firstly, you're using something like OpenStack, so it's a very API-driven thing to spin them up. But secondly, you may then end up with thousands and thousands of these virtual devices. And, you know, if you want to manage thousands and thousands of virtual devices from CLI, well, be my guest, but I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. And they come together, for example, in service chaining is very popular, and SDN and NFV come together very beautifully in, in that context. So what, what the orchestrator do then, for, to set up the service chain, the orchestrator calls the SDN controller to stitch the chain, but the devices in the chain are typically virtual. So uh, you spin up the virtual devices and you stitch them together with, with the SDN controller. So that makes the orchestrator being able of doing dynamic service chains. So without SDN and NFV, that would be impossible. Yes? How, how to tell about the solution if it's NFV or no? For example, CSR1000V, 
is MFV or it should be compliant with the HCA and FV definition? Uh, I will answer your last sentence. Remember that Etsy NFV is not something you can be compliant with. Etsy NFV is a Word document with some block diagrams, conceptual diagrams. You, you, you can't say if you're compliant or not. It, it's sort of a, a concept. It, it's a good concept, but it's not a standard to say compliant, not compliant. That's very important. I think you could comply, you could provide NFV with the CSR provide you virtualized network functions but it, it it's a gray area you know SDN was the old everything to everybody NFV is the new everything to everybody you know there there there's no one standard definition of these things across the entire world but in the NFV architecture you have a lot of API should you offer the same APIs not the same one but the, at the same point at the architecture for example I mean for my not necessarily from my personal perspective. The, the way I, I view that NFV document, it's sort of an RFI. I mean, if you look at those named interfaces, it's lines and it's a name. But what do they mean? They have a name. Do, do we as Cisco products need to have every line there? And by the way, those are not specified. So again, it's, it's an RFI and some products have a bundle of two boxes and the API within the box. That's fine. So it, it's, it's a conceptual architecture, nothing more. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, is it possible to install the SDN software uh, on my laptop and then while I'm going to customer to do automation of configuration. You understand the question? I answer it in a slightly different way. If you want to go to a customer and hook up your laptop and do some configs, um, fr from, from my perspective, you, you could install NCS or NSO as it's called now. It, it, it's a piece of software you can run on your laptop. You can hook up that to the customer devices and do config. That's not SDN. I mean, that, that's automation. <laughs> And you hook your laptop to whatever devices are there, and you talk CLI, you talk REST, whatever out there. So that, that sort of orchestration that you could go on site and dabble, that's not SDN. So I leave it to the SDN guys to also from their perspective. I can do. Well, I mean, I, I, I run it on my laptop, put it that way. So, um, and there's no, you know, back to that sort of use case, you're on, if you're on a customer site, you could, for example, use the controllers to discover their network topology, have the controller then add those nodes into something like NCS, and then NCS can, can go ahead and provision them if that's what you want to do. Yeah, for sure. I mean, from the point of view that it's open source, you can just download it, you can run it on your laptop, certainly either natively or, you know, you just run a VM on your laptop, and it's, it's very straightforward. And there's good support. Yeah, very much. And there's good support for device simulation, simulation with, with open daylight. Uh, through Mininet. So if you want to sit down and start messing with SDN, <laughs> understanding concepts, building topologies, open daylight, CDL is probably your best uh, starting point. Yeah, I mean, I tend to run, um, run the controller plus Mininet and potentially some virtual, some virtual routers. So XRVR instances, that sort of thing. And it's pretty easy to set up. Okay. So we have time for about one, maybe two more questions. Are there are questions regarding the SDN, SDN controllers, orchestrator. Yes. Yeah. Um, can you maybe elaborate a little bit more in the scalability of APKM in terms of number of devices and as well uh, on uh, reacting on real-time events? Well, real-time. <laughs> so APKM is built on a scale-out platform called Grapevine. Grapevine's an auto-scale PaaS that runs. So you install APKM to uh, ESX and will support uh, OpenStack pretty soon. So you install APKM into an IaaS, and from that point on, it will take over resources and scale itself appropriately. The thing about scale is that it's actually a you know a, a spectrum. Uh, the the nearer time you want your events, and the more devices that you have, and the larger the amount of uh, you know physical latency between those devices, that's going to lead to your actual physical deployment design, so that you can actually get events as close as you want them. 
there's no necessarily limitation to the amount of devices you can run or the recency of data you can get. It just depends on how much freaking hardware you want to throw at it. Uh, you know, we're hoping to spread that platform around as well so that all of the controllers are built on a similar scale platform so they'll all reach roughly the same scale numbers. For the controlled availability of APIC EM at the end of this week, hopefully, um, it's, it's fairly small. I think it's 500 devices, 500 access points, and 5,000 users. Uh, and this is just a single instance uh, deployment for CA. But, but can we react on a, in a sub-second? Uh, there's, there's no magic bullet. Speed of light rules, right? If you have sub-second access between a controller cluster and the device, then absolutely, why not? Also, uh, you know, when you start thinking about reaction time, uh, there is also on-device functionality that you can do outside of a controller to react quickly. If you want to do some local first-order analysis using something like the Embedded Event Manager to trigger on something locally, you could do that, take action on the device, and then even send a log out or information out to a controller saying, something occurred, I took an action, and here's the log or, or information about that event. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. In fact, one of the projects we're showing here, Distributed Network Analytics, they're actually doing some processing on the device before they send data off, and that's, that is one model. Another thing probably worth saying, certainly for the Cisco OpenSDN controller, is that um, you know, we talked about REST APIs. If you want really high performance, a better approach may be to embed code in the controller, so write, write code against the Java APIs. So then, firstly, you're running in the same process as the controller, so you don't have the context switching delays. But secondly, you're not having to then serialize the data out into XML or JSON. You've got access to it as native Java objects. So you, you will get higher performance with that approach, but you know, there is no free lunch. You get higher performance at the cost of having to write in Java and understand those object models more than you would if you write a, a REST application with a Python script. So it's, it's very much horses for courses. In APIC EM, we're, we're waiting for the devices to catch up a little bit. Uh, in order to do the investment protection that APIC EM does, where it just runs on whatever you have today, we heavily leverage CLI, and you know, we don't have a good event uh, notification uh, pathway right now. So uh, this is all you know, down the road, next couple of years, we're really hoping to see all of Cisco's devices adopt a much more uh, tenable interchange architecture for us to do these kinds of subsequent uh, events. Do we have any more time, or are we... We have two minutes? Yes. Uh, just a quick one for those who are interested in development experiences, virtualization around this space. If you want to come over to the SDP, SDN pod afterwards, we can show you what some of that would look like to answer, especially this gentleman's question here. Can you express that in the form of a question? I'm inviting <laughs> people. <laughs> That's it. Also, please join us at developer.cisco.com. You'll find all the technologies there. NSO will be online in about a week. But all the technologies are there. This technology is available. We're just bringing it into our uh, DevNet environment shortly. Uh, and finally, Nathan pointed out that we do have a pod where you can go learn about this. We also have learning labs, as I pointed out earlier, where you can get hands-on with these technologies and actually learn how they work, write code, run skips, and such. I want to thank all the technologists as well as the directors and the executives who joined us. Thank you very much.